so good morning, everyone. Um, so what we want to do um, in our conversation this morning is we really want to dive into the concept of an African agenda for inclusive development. And we have a great panel here to raise ideas, to provide promising solutions, and to offer ideas for replication where possible. But first, let's do a little bit of context setting before we get into the conversation. Um, this term inclusive development has been much talked about, and I appreciate that Vinit shared his understanding of what it means, and Anil shared his, um, the IFC definition of inclusive development, but at least in the African context, it sometimes feels unnecessary, at least to me, to actually describe the ad development agenda as having to be inclusive. But I think we actually know differently now. Um, it is what I think of as sort of the tale of two Africas. And I thought that the way this story was articulated on nextbillion.net was particularly compelling. Uh, there's a blog there called, um, Is Africa Rising or Falling? So there's a large, um, pretty overwhelming cohort of people um, who believe that the last 10 years in Africa has really set the stage, not just for Africa to emerge from stagnant economic growth, but actually to leapfrog into really great strides in improvement in terms of health outcomes, educational outcomes, infrastructure development, as well as significant reductions in, in poverty. Um, but there is another, I think, persistent narrative, something that I suspect um, concerns everyone in this room, or it should concern everyone in this room, and that is that the structural reforms that we see in the social, economic, and political institutions that are key for our development agenda um, are a bit shallow and a bit superficial and are not really embedded in the way in which that we need to work in order for us to be successful. Um, that is to say that they have yet to become systemic. So therefore, when the growth picture changes, as it inevitably will, when the pendulum shifts, that we might find ourselves with a different, perhaps less, much less optimistic um, growth scenario, future growth scenario. Um, so these are the two perspectives, two very different narratives um, of Africa, and I think it's fair to say that um, to some degree both are true. Um, there are re reasons to be quite optimistic. Um, Africa is the fastest growing continent on the globe today, um, but at the same time reasons to be pessimistic, maybe not pessimistic, but at least pragmatic about the, the future scenario for Africa. So in this conversation, what we want to do is really um, have a conversation about how we can take really promising examples of inclusive development, whether they be government-driven, um, private sector-led, or PPP-focused, and how we can take those examples and replicate them and get them to scale. Um, and in particular, how we can get the people in this room to have a conversation about how we really move the needle towards um, the kind of systemic change that we need to see in order to have sustainable um, growth in, in the long term. So I just want to say this conversation resonates really strongly um, for me, um, working for the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, we have two, two goals at the foundation. One of them is um, to advance inclusive economies that will expand opportunities more broadly for, for everyone, and that's um, a key focus of this conference. But there's another focus that we have around resilience, around ensuring that individuals and communities and institutions um, are prepared for and can emerge from um, acute stresses and shocks. So um, imagine situations where people lose their jobs, people um, suffer from adverse weather conditions. How do those people bounce back um, in order to, to continue to prosper? So now let me introduce my panel. Um, many of you know David Curia, those of you who live in Kenya. Um, he's a bit of a local hero in the social entrepreneurship space. Um, his, the company that he founded and runs called um, Ecotact is creating high quality sanitation facilities accessible to the urban poor by connecting sanitation as a part of the dignity of living in, in their communities. Importantly, his model has strong community buy-in um, as the community are involved in the design, construction, and the management of the facilities. David has received many accolades for his work, um, including being named an Africa Social Entrepreneur of the Year, a Schwab Fellow, and uh, a Shoko Lemelson Fellow. Uh, some of you may accuse us of a bit of a Rockefeller takeover because there are two Rockefeller Foundation alumni on the panel as well. 
um, Anthony, who spoke earlier. Um, I won't introduce him again, um, but I will say that he's one of the reasons why I joined the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and then um, Dr. Weba Bohr, who currently serves as the um, inaugural CEO of the Tony Alumilu Foundation, which is an Africa-based and Africa-funded not-for-profit institution dedicated to the promotion and the celebration of excellence in business leadership and entrepreneurship across Africa. And prior to joining the Lumilu Foundation, um, Weba was at the Rockefeller Foundation, and in fact, I'm sitting in his old office, so thank you, Weba. <laughs> and then um, I'm Rote Abdella, who is the director for VC and startups for Microsoft's For Africa initiative, which is a multi-year commitment by Microsoft to actively engage in Africa's economic development to improve um, global competitiveness. And prior to joining the Microsoft team, I'm Rote work with the World Economic Forum as a deputy director for the Africa region where she was responsible for a number of the key relationships and street strategic initiatives uh, with African governments and business leaders. So I have a really phenomenal panel of thought leaders here ranging from the social enterprise space to philanthropy to um, big multinational corporate. So I think a lot of diversity. So let's get into the conversation and dialogue that we want to have today. Um, again, the objective of this conversation is to really ground this concept of inclusive development with examples that really resonate uh, with this audience and hopefully leave us with some important takeaways um, for your respective organizations. So let me start with you, Anthony. Um, since you had the opportunity to talk um, about impact investing and this concept of intentionality, actually it was sort of related to my first question, but I want to hear from you before I ask you to talk about some examples of, of leadership um, and inclusive development. Um, do you think that this concept of intentionality, um, which is a central thesis for impact investing, is also important for our concept of inclusive development. Do you have to be intentional, or should we be thinking about intentionality as we create an inclusive development agenda for, for Africa? And then with that, if you could provide some examples of inclusive development that you've seen. Sure. Sorry. Um, again, I think, I apologize that the earlier panel, I think, was too theoretical. Um, and I, again, I feel like this is a group that doesn't want to debate theory. We want to get on with the business. Um, so I think, you know, the question of intentionality, it's important. Um, there is certainly, we, we need everything. We need businesses that pursue profit and growth and that because of pursuing profit and growth happen to create sustainable development. Um, yesterday, the, the, one of the, the, our colleagues from DFID, UK, UK Aid, mentioned the role of um, UK Aid in funding uh, M-Pesa. I was in Kenya when M-Pesa got started and talked to Michael Joseph at Safaricom. I don't think Safaricom had an intention to create economic development. They saw this as a really powerful opportunity to grow a business. They had no idea how big it would become. And it was really the people who use that tool who have made it an engine of development. So I think that's an example where there was not intentionality in it necessarily, but I certainly would not then say we shouldn't celebrate that as a success. Um, at the same time, without the people in this room and impact investors, with the intention to create development and use business as an engine for development, we won't get as much done as we could get. So I think I want to get away from the who's better, who's worse, who's right and who's wrong and say we need everything. Uh, none of us have enough wealth or of capital or ideas to say that we can just ignore others. You know, I, I really do think we need, we need all of it. And, um, but you, you'd ask for examples. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so Emmy had said earlier in the she sent us an email a few days ago and said, can you give us an example of an inclusive development success um, that's focused in Africa? And I think, again, I appreciate to get more concrete. So the, the example I, I thought about was work I had done. I worked here in 2005 and 2006 with an organization called TechnoServe, and some of you might know. Um, and I had an amazing colleague there named Fred Ogana, who's a real visionary. And he had set up a program uh, to support dairy farmers around Kenya to organize into cooperatives and really transform their position in the value chain from being the farmers who had a little bit of produce and therefore no power to being a cooperative that could really start to, to set the agenda themselves for how they participated in, in the dairy industry. And so is anyone here from Nyeri? I assume there must be some people uh, in Kenya. So those of you who know Kenya, Nyeri is an area uh, north of here that's in the, the dairy belt. It's um, near Mount Kenya, has more rainfall than other parts and has a hundreds-year-old tradition of dairy farming. 
Um, so in the area, when you, you, what is the success I'd like to highlight? There's a dairy cooperative called Mukwakulima Dairy. Uh, they're never going to win awards like David. Uh, they're not going to be flown off to fancy meetings and flown to Switzerland and London and celebrated. Um, but it is an amazing story of inclusive development. And what they have done is the farmers in that area got together around a very simple business idea, which was that instead of selling milk at the farm gate to whoever showed up and had a little bit of cash to pay, the farmers could get together and for a minimal capital investment, set up a dairy cooling plant. So basically this is a large refrigerator, that's all it is. Um, and the farmers bring their milk to this cooling plant which then allows them to negotiate longer term contracts where they can be selling thousands of liters a day to a buyer who is willing to pay a premium for the reliable volume, which completely changes how they operate um, in that supply chain. Now that they've been able to create the cooling plant, which then brings in a little bit of profits, they've set up a uh, lending operation next to that. So now the cooling plant allows the farmers to borrow against future sales. They've connected that to an agro vet and supply, input supply dealer. So now you have farmers who are earning more money for their milk, able to invest that back into their production, which then allows them to earn more money. And you've created this cycle of reinforcing where farmers can make more money, can reinvest that back into the, the production. Um, and a whole set of services have organized around that. The other thing I like about this story is it's now long enough. They've been at this for more than 20 years and they've been going for more than 10 years. They are now making about 800 million shillings a year in revenue, most of which goes back to the farmers. The farmers have typically increased their incomes 50 to 100 to 200 percent. And we actually, we, it's been long enough now that we can say this is a success. I think in our field we often, we have what I call in my book premature celebration-itis. <laughs> we get very excited when someone has an idea and they win all the awards. And we don't go back 3, 5, 10, 15 years and ask ourselves, is that success still happening? because by then we're on to the next thing we're celebrating. Um, these guys have never been celebrated, uh, but they also didn't just show up, grow, and then disappear. They have been forced in that community for a generation, um, and then for all likelihood, they, they will continue to be that. Although I do think a very important question for this panel is not just what are the successes we see, but why are there so few? And what have we learned from the failures? And I think later on in the panel, I'd love to talk about what we've learned as to why and what, what do they do differently up in Yeri that allows them to succeed and the many ways in which they could fail and we've seen failure happen elsewhere. Thank you, that's great. Actually then that, I'll turn to you David because you have been celebrated as a success story. Um, maybe it's not been 20 years yet, um, but maybe you could just reflect on really what are the elements of your model um, that, that have been successful or, or you think actually could be replicated to other models and if you could also talk about um, when you think about sort of the ecosystem of actors, um, donors, government, um, DFIs, the whole sort of ecosystem, what of that ecosystem has been most important for your model to be successful? Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my name is Korea David. I must admit that um, within the country, I run the biggest network of public sanitation in Kenya, and now I step into the region. Uh, there are several challenges, uh, and I would want to, to raise one of the key, few things that are really when we are looking at inclusive business, a uh, few things that we really, really need to focus. Uh, and especially at uh, this continent level, in the next few years, probably by 2020, uh, we will be clocking at least one billion population in this continent. Uh, and that's not a small number. Uh, and with that, more than 50% of that population will be youth population. And I think these are the opportunities that we need to tap in this continent. Uh, that we are getting into a space of youth population. Most of it will be urban, almost 60% will be urbanized by then. Uh, across the continent. And that is an immense uh, opportunity for engagement and inclusive uh, development uh, at the continent level and also at the country level. Uh, we also are a continent with immense natural resources, actually unexploited natural resources, that offers a good opportunity for either growth or collapse, depending on which direction we take. Uh, the informal sector, especially in Kenya, is a driving business 
for you who are spending <coughs> the evenings here, you just need to walk some few meters outside the intercon in the evening and see the drive of the industry across the country. We are talking about a, a sector that engages almost 80% of the labor in terms of the population of the country. And, and that's significant. In the informal settlements of Kebela, in the rural areas, uh, we, we have a driving informal sector. <clears throat> and I'm sure the Ministry of Industrialization uh, should be directing into how useful or how can we optimize this uh, sector. Uh, there is also a growing uh, framework of the CSR by the multinational and the corporates in Kenya, the safaricoms of this world. But again, to me, it's how effectively are we utilizing the CSR? Apart from the legal requirement that you need to, to, to donate to a social need. Uh, and the options that will be there is purposely trying to see how we can invest social corporate social responsibility in terms of social investment and tap within our own local resources. Uh, looking beyond and especially listening to the first session uh, at the global level, we are still a continent that requires to tap more on technology transfers. I don't think we have time to reinvent the wheel. And for us to grow, again, the minister talked about the vision 2030. That's less than two decades to come. I don't think we have the time to reinvent the wheel. Uh, in the last six years, when I launched the eco, -talk, uh, the eco toilet initiative in this country, uh, which we have now partnered with 25 formerly municipal governments uh, to see in the, the growth of uh, public sanitation, uh, we started in a very small way. Actually, we were just trying to, to model. And the first model is some few meters from Intercon. I think that was the first eco toilet uh, that we put five years ago, just outside the Intercontinental Hotel here at Uhuru Park. Uh, and the whole idea was to model approach of public sanitation that our local municipalities could uptake and improve the hygiene in our urban centers. Uh, but there were several challenges for that to take off or to stall. And some of them, again, the minister mentioned in terms of uh, access to resources. Because at the end of the day, how do we invest without uh, access to finances? And he said that finances are there, but are they affordable finances? I think that's the bone of contention. Mm -hmm. What's the cost of this finance? Uh, one of the things I must admit is the, the need for other actors and I'm not sure whether Acumen is represented here, uh, because those are the first people who took the biggest risk in this social business of sanitation, without any notable case study across the continent. But they went ahead and said, we can take the risk and finance a million dollars just to, 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 to scale up the initiative. And from there, I don't think we looked back. Uh, last year, we served about 13 million Kenyan users in one year. We are targeting this year 15 million users and I think that will be the big challenge to the, the big international organizations uh, our friends from Rockefeller and others in terms of taking risk because most of the ideas that we saw yesterday will not move forward if there are no organizations willing to take the risk the entrepreneurs have already taken the first risk of innovating coming up with a model that they are not even sure will work and I think that's the biggest risk the social enterprise or entrepreneur can take. The next is purely up to us, the bigger community, including governments, uh, to really enter into the space and provide either guarantees and reduce the risk from the, the investor. And, and that is something that is uh, happening. Uh, uh, we are still excited in this country as we, we explore to see how it works. Uh, within the government procurement, where they are opening the space for young business people, the young entrepreneurs, the SMEs, to step into the government procurement system. Again, it's a bit complex in papers, but we are hoping the first intention of opening up that space provide a goodwill to the Kenyan poor 
youth in the rural areas to step in. Because again, at the end of the day in Africa, the government are the biggest consumer. So if you manage to open up that market, you are giving an opportunity to thousands of young people who are almost hopeless down there. And I think that's a, a good approach. Again, we are watching to see how the government implement the, the, the process. Uh, and ultimately, that is a potential for a really inclusive uh, engagement across the board uh, within the, from the government and the poor people. The other key thing I would want to mention uh, in terms of the challenges that uh, really inflict the sector and the growth of it. And again, as an Ashoka Fellow, we have seen so many emerging innovations that don't see the second birthday. They just collapse. Why? The tax regime. The social enterprise, and I, I, I must admit that I was shocked when we started this. Uh, at one point, I, I was sitting with Acumen colleagues for, uh, who are the financiers uh, in discussion of the, the challenges that uh, we were faced, especially the early years. And I must admit in front of the minister here is that when I started the public toilet, I thought there would be extreme goodwill from the government because we are providing a social need. And the shocking thing was that I, when we started, we needed to get about seven licenses to operate a public toilet. I mean, I was shocked. Yeah, I was taken to court twice because of learning public toilet. And one of it was that there is entertainment in public toilet. There is radio, music. I need a permit for that. Yeah, and uh, th these are things that really slow down innovation. And especially in a country that we are saying we have youth population that need to be catalyzed to, to be the next MPESA geniuses uh, across. Uh, so the tax regime and the entire regulatory framework, we have also seen a lot of um, issues that need to be addressed in terms of uh, government uh, frameworks that are very weak. Uh, we only got the PPP, the engagement of the private sector, one year ago, after 50 years of independence. So when we entered into this space again uh, six years ago, we had no framework. We entered into a government on a gentleman's agreement, which is a bit risky for any investment. We felt there is need, and the need was there, to provide sanitation in our cities, but there was no framework for us to engage with the government until last year. So that gives us a good opportunity now in terms of really uh, promoting uh, enterprises like the eco toilet across the country, waste management, getting the young people out there in the villages to engage with the government now that there's a clear framework. But the challenges again of the PPP is extremely looking at the big infrastructure, not social infrastructure. So if you're not talking about several billion or uh, million dollars initiative, then you don't get the ear of the regime. And again, these are the things that we are saying that the government need to go down there and start seeing how do we support some of these ideas to be able to support uh, our growing uh, poor citizen. And the final one I would want to comment on, again, this is a big debate across the continent, is the issue of the poverty corruption. Because how do we open up a space? How do we expect to invest at local level from the 10,000 shillings uh, uh, of a young person getting and investing to the multi-million investment with the stringent uh, or the collaption uh, that we are seeing in the, uh, in the framework? And again, that is not only a Kenyan scenario. I would imagine that across the continent, we really need to address the issue of collaption to be able to open up the space. Thank you, David. I appreciate that really sort of very um, comprehensive perspective on, on you know, the, not only the opportunity, as you see it at the base of the pyramid, but really what the challenges are. Um, let me just get to some of the other um, members of the panel, and then we can get into a real conversation. Uh, Weba, um, David talked about the fact that entrepreneurs need to, they've taken the first step in terms of innovating um, and that the other institutions out there need to now take the next step after that. Can you share some examples of where you've seen um, entrepreneurs take that first step 
um, and innovate with um, product services that really serve um, the bottom of the pyramid and then now take that to scale. That wasn't the question you said you were going to ask me. Well, it's sort, yeah, of, it's sort of, okay. kind of. All right. Um, Good example. So we're based in Lagos, Nigeria. How many people are here from Nigeria? Uh, if this was a truly representative of Africa, you should be one in, one of every six people here should be Nigerian. So we'll have to do better next year. Um, let me just give uh, two examples from Nigeria. Um, I think often in this kind of space, you hear a lot of examples from places like Kenya, Ghana, etc. Um, and a lot of, I think, social entrepreneurs and so on are a little wary of Nigeria. Um, and there's really no reason for that because it's the one place in Africa you can immediately get scale for whatever you're trying to do. Um, so I'll give two examples. Uh, one is an agriculture example uh, run by a company called Dorio Partners. Uh, and they have invested in a company called Babangona, or they've started a company called Babangona, which in Hausa just means big farm. Um, and basically what they did is they went to northern Nigeria, to Kaduna, and took a lot of the models that you see are normally being done as a not-for-profit, sort of like the, the One Acre Fund, um, the, the uh, Millennium Villages, and they said, look, there's no reason these kinds of initiatives have to be done without a profit motive. We don't need to keep grant funding and fundraising, et cetera. We can actually do this, deliver the same service, and actually make a profit while actually also uh, significantly increasing the income of the farmers. So they've basically set up a, a, an agriculture, or a, a smallholder agriculture services company that provides all of the inputs um, from financing to, uh, to seeds, um, to irrigation, wh whatever they need, buys everything in bulk, distributes it to the farmers uh, in, in that part of Kaduna in northern Nigeria. And then the farmers now use it, and then they also, of course, provide a lot of uh, um, technical services and so on. And then at the end of the day, they buy everything back and then sell it in bulk uh, to the big commodity traders in Nigeria. And so they've, based, they've been doing this for they're in their second season now. Uh, in their first season, they worked with 1,000 farmers. And the average uh, farmer's income, I think, increased eightfold. I can't remember the exact number, but it was substantial. And it was, again, it's not rocket science. It's very simple. They basically said, let's take all of this stuff that's been innovated for years and done in a not-for-profit way, and let's actually make a business out of this. And they've really, really um, created a, you know, a, an example in northern Nigeria where smallholder farmers can actually have substantial increases in their income from pretty simple interventions. And because of the way they're doing it with a profit motive, um, after you know, some of the initial startup capital, uh, they will be able to run this you know, with, without any further, uh, without grant funding, et cetera, for, for years to come. Um, their, their goal is to expand to one million farmers in northern Nigeria within the next uh, 10 years. And I think that's actually infinitely possible. So that's one example. Um, and we're actually funding them, uh, along with the Rockefeller Foundation, as part of the Impact Economy Innovations Fund. Um, because what they're also doing is they're setting up a social bond where investors can now invest in this and actually become um, part of the, to, to invest in the, in the, the donor, the, not the, don the uh, loan fund that now farmers can, can uh, access capital from. Um, and so we gave them a grant along with the Rockefeller Foundation to innovate that and also to, to, to basically get it going. Um, the other example um, is a company called We Cyclers, which is also in Nigeria, in Lagos. And this is one, it was basically started by a young woman who, just a young Nigerian woman who finished Harvard uh, and had lots of options of what to do. And she said, okay, I want to go home and I want to do something at home. And so she set up a really innovative system to collect trash from uh, very low income communities around Lagos and then basically um, consolidate it and then sell it on to the, the, the large recyclers. And what she's done is she's in her model basically um, young entrepreneurs can, basic, can, can kind of become franchisees. They buy this, what they call a recycling uh, vehicle, which is basically a bicycle with a, something on the back that they can then load the, load the trash in. And they then now are the ones who now build their network of who they collected from. Even the people they collected from now become entrepreneurs and earn, earn revenue from this. So something that was basically just a huge social problem in terms of creating a lot of uh, waste and so on all over Lagos is now creating a lot of income for a whole chain of people. Um, we actually provided them with a very small grant when they started. It was just $5,000 to use that to get it going, run for the first three months, build a proper business plan, 
and now they've leveraged another $2 million in funding uh, and will definitely be able to take off. And this is something that the Lagos state government is also very supportive of and has given them all sorts of licensing. Um, and I think contrary to what David found in Kenya, in Nigeria, the, the government, especially on the Lagos state level, but also on the federal level, actually rolls out the red carpet and does everything they can for these kinds of innovative entrepreneurs to give them the licenses they need, the access they need, and to really help them take off. And so Lagos has given them you know, exclusive rights to collect trash in many, many uh, low-income neighborhoods, which also then means that they can really build the business and can really attract the investors they need to, to, to go to scale. So I guess those are two immediate examples. Thanks. And WeCycle um, presented yesterday, so yes, they did. So we got a taste of, of what of what they're trying to do in Nigeria and take that across the continent. Um, I, I want to um, ask them rotate to come into the conversation right now and really bring in the multinational perspective. When Anthony was sharing his remarks, he said that when uh, Safaricom, um, Safaricom and Vodafone were designing in Pesa, they weren't thinking about you know, the kind of impact they could have on the lives of so many people in such an inclusive development uh, with this sort of lens. But in fact, that's what they've ended up doing. Could you sort of provide a perspective from a multinational? What does this mean to you? What kind of work are you doing um, that has an inclusive development lens? And how does it fit in with the overall ecosystem? Great. Well, thank you. Um, so I think really, Coming from Microsoft, I think the easiest answer is to say integrate technology into everything you're doing and you have the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think coming back to what Anthony started with, um, absolutely, I think the intentionality is important, but I think at the end of the day what we will accomplish is far more important than what we start out with. So I think the business drive, the, the identifying the need and the demand, um, as obviously as Safaricom did as they launched M-Pesa, I think is really the key for us to identify you know, what we need to do to support startups and SMEs. So I think, let me take it back to Microsoft and the 4Africa Initiative. Uh, Microsoft launched the 4Africa Initiative uh, a year ago last year, uh, focusing on three pillars, uh, looking at skills, uh, training, providing technical support, but more importantly, really allowing startups and developers to have a platform to actually market the solutions. So the likes of Impesa gain traction and they gate market, uh, but there's so many others that don't. And so for that, Microsoft's support around that is to give them an innovation award, really cash injection to bootstrap their company so that they don't actually have to worry about the dollars and cents and actually can continue focusing on the business creation that will allow them to go to the next level. The second is really around affordable access. And I think there was a mention around uh, devices, tablets, mobiles. And the key for us is, as we're looking at the African market, as it's maturing, as it's becoming more and more sophisticated, is how do we actually allow the adoption of technology so that Africans are able to use smartphones? And with that comes connectivity, information, knowledge, and how do we make sure that that's integrated within the day-to-day -day living of most Africans? And so there's a lot of emphasis on agriculture, health is another one, as well as education. The third pillar is around um, skills, and that is, you know, how do we actually make sure that the youth bulge that Africa is being talked about actually has a landing space once they go into the workforce? What trainings and skills can we provide as a multinational looking at investing uh, on the skills development, training, employability of the youth. So I think what's key, I mean, and I think we'll go into a, a more frank discussion, is most of this is not driven by CSR. Uh, and it's really, there's a business angle to it, there's a commitment to it, uh, not because it feels good, but because there's actually dollars and cents and business commitment to actually make this work. And I think for the basis of public-private partnerships, as most of us have discussed, is it's important to have the intention and the, the, the feel-good factor, but at the end of the day, it's what's really behind us in committing our resources, services, and products to actually make this work. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think, is, is the basis for, I think, what will be the next discussion that we'll go into. Mm -hmm. uh, but for Microsoft, it's really understanding the need, the gap, but also the opportunity and the potential that the African market has and has to offer as we look at growing local solutions that will become regional and eventually global so that we can have the next phase of, start of Facebooks and Twitters that will actually be African grown, African developed solutions. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's get into a bit, uh, bit more of a conversation and I and invite all of you to jump in and, and argue with each other 
if you'd like. Weba and I are from Nigeria, so we don't mind arguments at all. Um, so I guess the, the thing that I struggle with is, you know, we see a lot of pilots, a lot of niche um, projects. They all look really interesting and sexy. Um, and then we always have this conversation about getting them to scale. And there is that problem. Why are they not getting to scale? What, what is happening um, to prevent these, these ideas, which seem really interesting and seem really promising, what's really preventing them from having the type of traction that's necessary to really succeed? So what are the challenges? David talked about a few in his experience um, here in Kenya, but I'd love to hear some other perspectives on, on really what you see are the potential obstacles to getting, again, really good examples, but actually getting them to really have tremendous impact in the next 10 years. Maybe I'll start and talk about this experience with Mwakulima Dairy up in, up in Nyeri. There are lots of other places where that, the economic conditions are ripe for that same idea to be replicated. Mm -hmm. There are lots of parts of Kenya where people know how to you know, basically feed cows and grow milk. And there are lots of parts of Kenya where you could set that same basic idea up. And many donors are out there throwing money at projects and starting projects, and very few of them last. And I think three things we've learned, and this is true in the coffee sector in Rwanda, very similar story where there's a lot of people growing coffee, but it's not getting a lot of value, it's not coordinated. So huge efforts to try to coordinate and professionalize the agricultural economy, which is the part I know best, which is the, still is the largest employer and, and engages more people than any other sector. And so I think three things we've learned. Um, the first is governance, and I think David hinted at this around the way the government interacts, but it's not just about is the government supporting or thwarting efforts. Uh, it's often about are you ultimately creating the conditions within a community that can sustain the initiative. I think a lot of these donor-driven projects focus on the economics, uh, but then completely miss the importance of setting up the governance within a cooperative or within a company. Uh, the second really crucial one is leadership. And again, we celebrate social entrepreneurs, uh, which is great. In the case of Mwakulima Dairy, they had a really wonderful manager uh, who, who led it the first 10 years. Um, but then he decided to get a job uh, here in Nairobi, and he was going to quit. Um, and had he quit, I suspect the dairy would not have taken off the next 10 years the way it did. The farmers actually made an intervention, and they went to his house, um, and they told him he couldn't leave. Um, I don't think they physically stopped him. They might have, but they really pressed on him the opportunities he had to really steward that community in a way that his new job, which might pay more, wouldn't. But without that kind of leadership commitment and stability, uh, we often see these fail. And I think the third one, which is very important, is, and this gets to the point around Microsoft's commitment, in Mwakulima Dairy now sells about 70,000 liters of milk every day. And they sell that milk to Brookside, which those of you in Kenya know is, is a large dairy company. Brookside was backed by a set of uh, private equity investors about 15 years ago to really create a larger company that could really drive forward the professionalization of the dairy industry in Kenya. And the reason I bring this up, and it's not just specific to the dairy industry, they are a buyer of Mwakulima's milk who have a vision about growth for the sector. And because they have a vision about growth, they have a partnership with this dairy enterprise that is about a long-term partnership of mutual trust. And because they are looking to grow, it is incredibly important for them that they have partners who are also going to grow as suppliers. If you didn't have that dynamic, then the relationship would purely be about how do we make the most profits in the shortest term, and the whole conversation would be about margin. It would be Brookside saying, we want to pay you as little as possible, and it would be Mwakulima saying we want to be paid as much and you'd have a fight and whoever had more power would win. And that's where we're stuck most of the time because we have this scarcity mentality that says we all need to make as much as we can right now on the next deal we have. And when you have that mentality, you do not have the conditions in which people can say we have a mutual interest in each other's growth. So Brookside would be willing to pay a little bit more right now because they know that five years from they, now, they need Mwakulima to be even bigger. So I think the other piece that's missing is we focus on the entrepreneur in isolation without recognizing that most entrepreneurs will not succeed unless they have partners who have a vision about growth rather than a vision about scarcity. And I think in Africa, we've been stuck for too long in the sense that we all need to make as much as we can today to survive because we don't have faith 
that we are part of growing economies with a long-term vision that we can all mutually support each other to enjoy. And I think if you don't have that basic sense, and it's not just from government, it has to be from government, it has to be from the foreign investors, it has to be from the corporates, um, and it really has to be about all of us who have a commitment to a sense that we can grow together. Without that, I think a lot of these businesses, they'll succeed, they'll win some awards, they'll get some investments, they'll flare up and then they'll die. That's a really good example, um, Anthony, because I think, I mean, Brookside is a, is a big, it's a big company with a lot of resources and a lot of assets and can actually have a vision for the sector. I wonder if smaller entrepreneurs who are operating in a smaller space have the luxury of thinking that way, which is what might cultivate this scarcity mentality, which I, which I think is actually quite pervasive. Please jump in and... and I actually have one objection. Yes. This is how we're going to keep this entertaining yes. for the crowd. Um, Nigeria, and we're in Kenya so I can say this, Nigeria is not an easy market to grow to scale. Because to grow to scale, you actually have to survive in Nigeria. And so I think there are a lot of infrastructural support that are actually needed to be put in place to actually support startups and SMEs. So I think there, there's that factor that, you know, in pitching, you know, the, the market potential and the market size, yes, it's there. But I think that some of the basics are still missing in some of the bigger countries that we have. Uh, I think uh, in terms of the, the, the case of uh, the Brookside and the, the small scale farmers, uh, ultimately, uh, as a continent, and that's really where I would want us to see ourselves, is being part of the value chain, not the supply. Yeah? Because at the end of the day, Brookside could be having that big vision that kills the small entrepreneur in terms of the vision. Because it's not about the supply. Mm -hmm. yeah? If the small entrepreneur, say in Nandi or wherever, were empowered and supported to put a cooling system, it would have added value to the milk before Brookside steps in. Mm -hmm. But if the Brookside goes and sets up these systems in the local villages, then the farmer or the entrepreneur becomes purely a supplier. And it ends there. Uh, so, in terms of really long-term thinking for this continent, I think the value addition, being part, engaging our citizenry to be part of the value addition. And I'll give one example, uh, again, of the eco toilet, which we did five years ago. And last year, as part of the green growth by the Danish government, we engaged and really dialogued with the corporates from Denmark. And... Uh, by end of the last year, we launched the first model toilet of vacuum system. And, and that is purely a great innovation from the aircraft of the vacuum system to the ground. And the reason being principally that we are lacking water. And we cannot afford the luxury of rushing water in this continent. So any addition being part of the value chain system, to me, adds value. Now we have a product that's superior, where we can even market it in UK, in Washington, a vacuum system on wheel, which is purely a toilet. We can deliver it anywhere without consuming water. Now, that's part of value chain. And I think the big multinational need to engage the local citizenry, particularly in Africa, whether it's Microsoft or others, to see how do we make sure that the continent citizens are part of the value chain and they benefit. Uh, there, are, there are notable cases that are coming up, and I think one of the ones that I would want to name is the, the recent announcement by the government of Japan uh, in terms of the African Business Education Initiative for the youth, where they are targeting to engage a thousand young people from the continent, engage them in their businesses or corporates back in Japan in a view of partnering to bring the technology and partner with those, the sharp the, and the big corporates from Japan to the continent. To me, there lies a future for this continent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let me uh, add a few points to Anthony's suggestions on why so many of the social entrepreneurship pilots and so on don't scale and don't take off. Um, I think one is a point he made earlier about premature celebration. Um, people, you know, they have a great idea, they get celebrated, they're on the circuit they forget about the business and never come back. Um, another, I think, is wrong incentives. I think there's, you know, sort of a, social entrepreneurship is sort of like the next step from sort of grant funding, right? And so um, there's a lot more focus on the social than the entrepreneurship. 
And so I think often we kind of, for, we, we make investments and we give money because, oh, the social story is so great, but fundamentally there's no business. And, and so they fail, and in fact, it was never going to be more than a pilot, but it made a good story, so we, so we got funded. Um, I also think that, uh, and since you said we, we can be controversial, I'll be controversial. So I was um, raised as a missionary kid in northern Nigeria, um, and sometimes when I see talk about social entrepreneurship, it's almost like social entrepreneurship is the new missionary movement. Um, it's the young people who have sort of evangelical zeal about that they will change the world through business. Um, and so their focus is not really necessarily on actually building a great business. It's on personally saving the world in some little corner. And so they don't necessarily even have the ambition to be scaled and to be big. They just want to kind of, you know, do something. Um, and what I also find is that because of that, they end up going to the easy places. And so you probably find 90% of the social entrepreneurs in Africa are probably in Nairobi and Accra, right? Which, fine, you know, it's a nice place to live, etc. It's the same place all the missionaries are too, by the way. Um, but they're not in Lagos. And yes, it's very difficult, very, very difficult. But if you can get it right in Lagos, you have 20 million people right there, which is more than the entire population of like 30 other African countries. And I think the story is always like, oh, it's too hard, let's start in Nairobi where there's a great, you know, sort of ecosystem for this, or let's start in Accra, it's easier, and then we'll scale and we'll go to, La nobody ever leaves. They start in Nairobi and they stay in Nairobi. They start in Accra and they stay there. And so I think we need to kind of challenge them to say, okay, go beyond your comfort zone, go where it's really, really hard, and make it work there. So the guys from Babangona, they went to, cut, you know, around Zari in northern Nigeria. Everyone else in the world is scared of that part of Nigeria because of the Boko Haram story. They tried to hire a farm manager who had been working in Eastern DRC. And he said, he actually grew up in Northern Nigeria and he said, you know what, I think I'll be safer in Eastern DRC than in Zaria. You know, and that's where they chose to go and they're making it work. Um, and so I think, I think social entrepreneurs have to go beyond the sort of messianic complex and actually just go where it's hard, go off the beaten track, don't worry about the story and just make the impact first and then worry about the story later. I, I, I would actually offer that. I think it's, uh, if there's a social enterprise working with young people in Madare or one of the other slums in Nairobi, they wouldn't qualify that as easy. But I think the difference is that there are maybe like-minded communities. So, so they have uh, there are other social entrepreneurs who are like-minded. They can sort of share their pains and suffering. And that's why there's so much um, going on in some of these um, pockets of social entrepreneurship like Nairobi and Accra. That's just my, my sense of it. Um, but happy to have anybody sort of dispute that. I'm going to take I, I think just to add to that, I think there's also an element of a cultural shift that needs to happen, which is that trial and failure is actually okay. And, and I don't think that's actually a, a, a phenomenon that has been celebrated, acknowledged in Africa, right? So the few cases of those who have done well that you see, and, and some of them have gone on competition tours, and that's what they do, which is fine. But really the idea that, you know, you, the risk taking that innovators have done by coming up with the idea what they think is right, what they think is, is needed, uh, may not work, and that's okay. And so I think there's, there's an element of failure that we also, I think, have to acknowledge and accept as we try to grow to scale some of the innovations that are coming out of, out of Africa. Excellent, thank you. So I think we can, looking at my, I'm getting cues. Can I take some questions? Yes. yes? Are there any questions from the audience? Perfect. I see a hand right here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Mark. I'm from Mobi Changa Limited. We have a innovative mobile fundraising product, which is helping people do very mund thing, mundane things like getting married, uh, funerals, medical care, and so forth. So we're, we're building that business. And I guess I'll, I'll direct this question to Ms. Lohr and to Ms. Abdallah. Ms. Lohr mentioned sort of resi you know, innovating products that help people bounce back, that encourage their resi resilience. Ms. Abdallah mentioned uh, allowing SMEs to get to the next level, and that resonated with me. And you know, you guys uh, both represent uh, uh, organizations that have been active in Africa and, uh, and uh, sort of what should my 
position as a co-founder of this company be towards organizations like you that are providing uh, services and support and leadership to companies like mine? Do you want to start? Do you want to take? So, um, and I would like, actually I'd like Reba and, and Anthony to come in to jump in here too if you have um, something to say on this matter. I actually, I think it's a challenge for a social enterprise to sort of shift themselves and craft themselves for a particular foundation or donor. And that, you just get in trouble that way. Um, the reality for us as big organizations is that we create um, programs and initiatives and we fund things that, um, that sit within that framework. If you sit outside that framework, it won't, it won't happen. And so, um, so, and sometimes it's just luck, I would say. There are already a lot of enterprises there and it's no different uh, from what we see in India. You know, the, most of the social enterprise action is really around the big cities. But actually it's in the poorer towns, tier two, tier three towns where a lot of business action is already happening. It's about going there and making sure that these guys are structured to scale and can actually absorb capital and whatever the other challenges are, human and capital, to scale them. So, so I would actually like to challenge you on that. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you. I'm saying more of the people who brand themselves and put themselves out there as social entrepreneurs. Um, but th there's hundreds of thousands of social entrepreneurs in Lagos, absolutely. But the, 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 the impact of what you're saying is that on the investor side, what we do is we go where it's easy. You know, the path of least resistance is where we see lots of people. Um, so it's, it's a very good point that there are these other pockets that we're potentially ignoring because they haven't self-identified or branded themselves in this way. Um, my name is Cosma Sokoli. I'm where here. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm on wheelchair. Um, my name is Cosma Sokoli from Nigeria. I run a nonprofit called Mobility Aid and Appliances Research and Development Center. <clears throat> it's a nonprofit, and uh, I, I've just discovered a kind of disease in nonprofit um, arena, and that is most of the time we focus squarely on the social aspect of our work. Sometimes these projects have some business spin offs. But we really don't look at them. And sometimes some of us consider it uh, a kind of sin to begin to explore those areas. So um, Dr. Weber of uh, Tony Lumini Foundation, my question is, I mean, you gave an example of a project in the North that used to be so, solely uh, nonprofit driven that someone went in and made it a business. Now. Do you have or do you engage social entrepreneurs, nonprofit organizations to explore you know, the possibility of business spin-offs from their projects? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we can, we can talk offline. Um, but absolutely, that's, that's definitely, I think, a, something that's happening more and more in the NGO space is that non-for-profits realize, wait, there's actually something I'm doing that actually has a revenue potential. And the old model was that didn't, they didn't really pay attention to that. They would still keep seeking grants. But I think now you can actually find ways to, to commercialize some of what you're doing. And then that can actually fund the purely social activities. So let's, we'll follow up after. Okay. But what, one thing I'd say is we see in our work lots of nonprofits who struggle with money. And you get very frustrated raising money and say, because I can't raise grant money, I can't grow. And then they come and say, well, so I'll start a business. And that'll be the silver bullet that will save my organization. That almost always fails. You know, one thing I hope we all take away from this conference, and we said in the morning panel, running businesses is really hard. And if it's hard for anyone who's just focused on running the business, why do we think it'll suddenly be easier for a nonprofit organization that has a whole nother orientation and, and, and so forth? So there are lots of examples of nonprofits that have succeeded doing what you talked about, taking part of what you do and spinning it out. But you don't hear about all the people for whom that doesn't work. And so I think the, to me, the, the big message is not, now let's try and start businesses because somehow that's easier or better. But it's really, what is the social goals you have for your organization? What are the different kinds of revenues and money you need? And what's the easiest way to get that? And in some cases, starting a business might be the answer. Um, in many cases, it won't. Nonprofit is not a business plan. 
it's a way to file your taxes with the government. At the same time, business is not a way to suddenly create a, a cash cow. Um, business is a real struggle. So I think the advice we always give our clients is start from the social purpose you're trying to achieve and then find out what are the right ways to do that. And maybe business is the right answer. Um, but again, I, I would just caution everyone against thinking that this is the easy way to solve your problems when growing your nonprofit has been hard enough. So I don't want to be too sobering, but this is all hard. Uh, there's just, you know, none of us have chosen to do the easy things. That's why we're here. One more question? Is that okay? Or no? No. No. Okay. All right. So I've been told, sorry, gentle, I'm sorry. I've been told that, so <laughs> I'm finished. So I'd like to really thank this panel for what was a really interesting and um, engaging conversation. I'd ask you to really uh, thank this panel as well. A round of applause for this panel. And from now on, you go into plenary session, so hopefully this will inform the conversations that you have later today. Thank you, M.A.M., Rote, Anthony, David, and Webe for such a thought-provoking conversation. May I now request M.A. to hand over a small token of appreciation to all our speakers. <laughs> There you are. So now you have two. And yeah. what are you going to do with two? More to pack in my life. David, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.